Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for home theater geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Our Twit special today is brought to you by Ford, featuring all electric and hybrid electric technologies. Learn more about the technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles at Ford.com slash technology. Hey, everybody. We're uh, here at the DTS booth. We're going to begin our Home Theater Geeks show in just a moment. I'm trying to pull up Chad if I can. A little hard to get bandwidth. I'll tell you what, though. You guys are getting bandwidth. That's the live view. Hilton Goring, our camera guy. Hello, Hilton is uh, rocking the new mini live view. What is the name of this? What do you call The what? Oh, the LU40. Wow. As opposed to the 60, which is bigger. This thing uh, is no longer a backpack. Show Burke. Come here, Burke. Burke, what, what are you, a model for the old live view? Yes, I am. In case something goes wrong. This thing, this thing is 25 pounds. It's heavy. And Hilton's wearing, uh, you can't see it because he's got it on. It's like hanging off his hip. It's like as big as a lunchbox. Oh, Ken's got one. Ken Zamkow from uh, Live View. Look at the size of the big difference. But same idea. It's an encoder decoder that has, uh, in this case, four 3G cards in it from Sprint, Verizon, and AT&T. And uh, that's what's streaming out to you. So a word of warning. We are recording this. And we will, of course, have a high-quality recording available as a download of Home Theater Geeks. But we may cut in and out sometimes. We may have some issues. Sometimes sure. that happens with the Live View. Just now you know why we're on 3G. The live view works great. It's just this is a very challenging environment. Yeah. So what are we going to do first? We are going to, we're here at DTS. We're going to talk with Alan Parsons and Elliot Shiner, mm -hmm. two of the most respected uh, producers and engineers in the music industry over the last 30, 40 years. I am, I am kind of uh, a little nervous. Let's go on over. <laughs> Let's go. I'm very excited. Alan Parsons worked at Abbey Road Studios while the Beatles that's were right, recording. That's he was right. a sound engineer then. He worked on the last two Beatles <laughs> albums, and he also worked on uh, Dark Side of the Moon with Pink Floyd. Yeah, in fact, I've watched uh, movies about the making of Dark Side of the Moon, and of course, Alan Parsons figures largely in this. That was a, an amazing uh, recording because they used so many techniques and synthesizers. It was one of the first uh, uh, multi-channel music recordings as well. We'll ask Alan about that. I'm, I'm pretty excited to do so. So here we go. We're going to walk on over here and say hi to El you. You must be Elliot. Oh, no, that's Alan Parsons. Alan. You look so young. How could you be so young? <laughs> um, Did you start at the age of 12? The brand of hair dye I'm using. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good to meet you. And Elliot, it's nice to meet you. Uh, we're here at the DTS booth. Uh, first of all, you want to explain the association with DTS so we can get the plug out of the way? Um, well, I think we, we, yeah. we've both been working with DTS for some years now. Uh, ever since the uh, 5.1 format came out, Originally, um, DCS were very much at the forefront of that technology, and you know, being able to bring 5.1 channels to uh, to consumers. So uh, ever since then, I've been in you know in, in regular touch with them, and they've been very supportive of everything I've been doing. So it's exciting. Yeah. Now, what I find so cool about both of you is that you've been in the music business, producing and engineering records for five for, decades for so many years, and yet you embrace new technologies as they come out. Many people. Uh, at our age, <laughs> uh, might resist and say, "Oh, I know how to do He's this." Older than you guys, it's okay. But I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh, but but you guys have embraced it all along, especially you, both of you. But but Elliot, uh, I asked you about this the other night. You really uh, have embraced multi-channel music as uh, the way to record and mix music. Absolutely. Yeah, I've been doing stereo for so long prior to 5.1, and it, having three. Three new speakers and uh, three extra speakers and a subwoofer. I mean, it, it was so compelling, you know, to be able to spread music all around, listen to, listen to it unlike I've ever listened to it. Now you also said to me that it actually is easier to mix to multi-channels than to two channels. It is. You don't have to, you know, you're not dealing with putting everything in stereo, so you've got a lot more room. You don't use as much compression. There's a place for everything, you know, so you're not trying to make things that are not audibly, not, not real audible come out. You know, you've got a, you've got a separate space for, for most instruments. Now, how does um, this multi-channel mixing idea comport with um, 
MP3s and downloadable music? I mean, are we getting multi-channel downloads? I know a lot of people download MP3s. It's, it's not really my area, but I think, um, I think we have to be looking uh, to a future with downloadable surround music. You can. Dolby, Dolby, Dolby. Dolby does support it in, uh, in one of their encoding, AAC, I think. And DTS must as well. I'm, I'm, sure, uh, I'm sure it's out there. I mean, all, all you, I mean it's, it, the, the codecs are you know, stereo compatible, so that, that means that they should be downloadable. Yeah, and of course, with, uh, with binaural imaging, you can use two speakers and get a full sound stage. There are, there are a couple of, of sites that where you can don't download 5.1 mixes. They don't have a lot of content, but you, you can download. And, uh, you know, frankly, I mean, I, I wish more people were downloading stereo uh, in high bit resolution. I mean, MP3 should just go away forever. Really well, this, this is one of the main points that DTS is trying to make at the show, which is that the quality of the audio, the sound quality of recordings matters. And I think uh, one, of the, one of the points that was made at the uh, presentation we did the other night mm -hmm. is that people need to be exposed to higher quality audio. Many younger people in particular only know low bitrate MP3, and so they don't realize what they're missing. I, I think it has to be said that you know, most people accept uh, in movie theaters that, that sound is gonna be in surround, but so many people just don't realize that, that music is so much better when it's heard multi-channel, you know? And, um, you know, I think one of the reasons we're here is to try and uh, revive the interest in uh, surround music as well as just surround sound in general because, you know, music is a big part, big part of what I would like to see surround doing. I can understand that with a symphony, you've got a huge sound stage, but 5-1 sound, does that make sense in a band? I mean, uh, we only have two ears. What, what, what are we hearing in the rear channel? The classic question, huh? Uh, I, saw, I saw this funny video the other day um, made in the 50s and 60s, you know, saying that uh, uh, when stereo first came along, it was all down to profiteering, you know, <laughs> people trying to sell music, you know, uh, on two Sell an extra and, speaker. And it's not real, it, you know, we, we support mono. Da, 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 da. But really, uh, I mean, I think stereo... Uh, was to mono what surround is to stereo. I mean, it really is a, a qualitative difference. Oh yeah, I mean, it, it's it's just a new experience, you know, hearing it in surround. Although I know, you know, when the Beatles uh, remixes uh, came out, that pe there were people who preferred the mono recordings in mono. Well, you you know, they're entitled to that. I mean, that's what it. That's the medium it was made for. I mean, it's true. When you remix it as stereo, it's not the same. I mean, uh, you, should, you, you should hear his his surround mix of Dark Side of the Moon. There's, there's a uh, tying to. It's ridiculous. Is there a surround mix of it? Yeah, it just um, it just actually came out uh, in a box set, um, which uh, went out oh maybe six weeks ago. Now, did you, you recorded that in eight track? How how many? How and how do you get the uh, the spatiality? Well, it, it was a mix from 1973. Uh, so you did it that way. Uh, it was done in. You did quad. it in 4.0, 4.0, because uh, that's what it was. It was quadraphonic, uh, just uh, front left, front right, back left, back right. Um, yeah, I mean, quad, that was the age of quad, very short, very short lived. <laughs> I remember the joystick and you'd come and you'd invite friends over and you'd, you'd move the music around like that. You didn't do that with Dark Side. No, no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think the joystick had been invented by that time. <laughs> now, uh, Elliot, you've done uh, 5.1, you, you're, you're a pioneer in that with the, the Eagles, for example. Yeah, the, the Eagles, that was my, that's when my affiliation with DTS started. They'd come to me and asked me to mix... Uh, Hell freezes over in surround sound, so that was my introduction. And I, you know, I say ever ever since that day when they introduced me to it, I haven't looked back. You know, it's just it's so compelling, and it opened a new career for me. Now, at the in the uh, demo room just over there, they're actually playing 11.1 mixes. Have you been working? Either of you been working in that high a channel count? Yes, I've been uh, uh, been working with two. Uh, LA-based acts, one called the Subclones and one called uh, the Good Listeners, and um, 11, <laughs> 11 point one speakers. I mean, that's a lot of speakers to deal with, and uh, you know, joystick. There's no joystick that can uh, <laughs> go eleven <laughs> places, so you've got to do it on a computer and uh, a know, joy and, uh, sphere, perhaps. How do you? So, what, what are you? What are you? What is your goal to create a 360 degree sound, or to place the bass here and the drums there? I mean, how, how do you use that? The nice thing about 
11 channel is that you've got height. There's, there's two speakers uh, above you, uh, which you know, is another dimension. So I can see with Dark Side of the Moon where it's synthesized and there's a, it, it's, you know, you're kind of in your mind space. But with a band, I mean, don't you want the stage right there? Um, I don't want the bass above me. If it was a live show, then you might want to represent, you might want to, but, but for example, <laughs> Elliot didn't do that. He, 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 he uh, mixed uh, the Eagles live, but there's stuff everywhere and it sounds great. You know? So, I mean, you can take two, two, two views on that. You can say, I want to recreate the exact experience of sitting in the audience, or I can be creative and move things around and have things behind me, above me, below me, or whatever. It is a little bit like going from black and white to color. It fills your whole brain. There's exactly stuff everywhere. Right. That's a great comparison, black and white to color. No, I, I remember talking to Wayne Coyne of the Flaming Lips. He was very excited about uh, DVD audio and SACD because this is one of the issues is a CD is stereo. Uh, MP3s are stereo. I mean, we, you know, there For are the most part. There are some standards. How do we get surround sound out to people, not just on, on uh, iPods, but even in their home theater? I guess they have it in the home theater. DVD audio and SACD didn't really succeed. They didn't take off. In the the Blu-ray, is that the only way we can do it? I think at, these, at this point. There's an awful lot of uh, receivers out there with uh, DTS decoders in them, and uh, you, you can still get DTS decoders. But where's the media coming from? Well, it's out there. It's just people just don't know about it. I mean, D DCS themselves have got product out there, and well, my, it's my true own in albums included. You know. So when you record a CD, it can be DTS encoded and played back on an appropriate player? Yeah, you have to mix it for 5.1, and then, and then it gets uh, encoded into a, uh, into a format which is just like stereo. I mean, you, don't, you, you can't play it in a stereo system, but it's, a, it's, it's the same kind of information. It's, it's a PCM encoded uh, bitstream. So... Yeah. Is Wayne at the show? Uh, I don't know. I would love to. If he is, I'd love to find him. He, what a creative fella, huh? I did their, I did their, uh, their first 5-1 mix. It was uh, Yoshimi. Uh, yeah, Yoshimi. The battles the pink robots. Pink robots and, yeah. and uh, you know, he, I, that's when I talked to him, and he was very excited about it. Yeah, I mean, we had the whole thing spinning. Yeah. Everything mm -hmm. was revolving. But they even do that in concert. I mean, they really they, they want to bring a, a very exciting I, stage. I, yeah, exactly. Great. What a great guy. Yeah. I'm hoping that we can get Tales of Mystery and Imagination in 5-1. I hope so, too. One of my favorite albums. Just uh, let's get Universal uh, Music to, uh, to finance it. You know. <laughs> so I'm not doing it for free. Is it an elaborate process to go back and take uh, the old tapes? And it's, it's fun, actually. I mean, it's, really, uh, it's really fun to, to revisit stuff. And, uh, you know, you, uh, as Elliot was saying earlier, it's actually easier to balance stuff in, in surround. And uh, yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to do it. I'd love to. Re Both of you have seen such changes from, I, and I don't even know, you might have worked in the mono era at Abbey Road. I, I, I don't know if you went that far back, but to go from that to modern recording technology uh, in such a short period of time is, is mind boggling. How, it, it, is it easy for you to keep up with the changes or is it something that you have to work at? Well, you, 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 can, you can use new technology as much as you want. Or, or you can or choose to uh, you can choose to avoid it. You, know, you can just you obviously embrace it. You, you can well. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. I mean, a hard disk recorder. You can you can treat it just like a tape machine if you want to. Right. Or you can start cutting and pasting and using plugins and all kind of stuff. But if you want it to just be to behave like a tape machine, you can. And uh, more often than not, that's what I do. I think I think it was a lot easier for us to grow with the industry because it was in steps. Like right. when I started, it was three, four track, right. you know, but there were still people doing mono and stereo. Sure. But you know, as over the years, you, you learn with all the new stuff for, for the younger kids that are starting a career now, it's a little more difficult because they've got to not only learn what we learned, you know, mic technique and balancing, right. but they have to learn all this other technology Everything. and it's all at once. My son's 17, he's using Ableton Live and Logic and he's got an MPC and exactly what he says, it's overwhelming yeah. because you can do anything. Yeah. And, and in a way it's harder to be able to do anything than only be able to do a few things. Yeah, yeah I think one of, the, uh, one of the marks of a good record producer is to be decisive, to say this is where we are with it, I'm fine with it, not, not leave any... Uh, you can mess around forever. Yeah, you can, um, nothing... <laughs> Exactly I right. I mean, like uh, it was once said of any uh, creative work, you, d you don't so much finish it as abandon it. You know, so. <laughs>
Do you look back at some of the records you guys have made and say, "Gee, I wish we could we could we could refinish that record." Oh, I mean, there's countless stories of, of, of people remixing records when they're already in the shops and being played on the radio. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, that was bad. <laughs> I gotta go back and fix it. Such a thrill to talk to you guys. I want to thank you for your time and uh, thank DTS for making uh, making you available. Uh, Alan Parsons, and Elliot, Elliot Shiner, Elliot Shiner, great to meet you both. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And if I find Wayne Coyne, I'll have him roll his ball over here and you can. <laughs> I will. Really great talent. It's so nice to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're both. just beginning our tour of the We've, CES show floor. Where do we go two next? Hour tour. It is. Uh, we may get lost. We may sink our minnow uh, on, this, on the shoals of all this technology. There's that's so much right. stuff to see. Um, some great TVs. I do hope we're planning to go see those OLED TVs. Oh, yeah, that's next, actually, over at LG. All right, let's take a walk. We're going to go to LG now. A reminder, those of you who are watching live, uh, we will continue to stream, and we're going to use this great live view and the 3G that we've got going and give you the best uh, quality we can. But you can go back and watch after the fact where we'll have high-def video available at twit.tv. Uh, that's how it works here when we do it at CES. We do the best we can. But there are dead spots. I was told that uh, you know there's places we just can't, we just can't go. <laughs> We're in a big concrete and steel building. It's amazing. 3G works with at all. With so much bandwidth being used by 140,000 cell phones. Well, and that's one of the big problems. You know, um, AT and T, uh, uh, of course, uh, and the iPhone. Everywhere you go, people are using iPhones. Maybe a little oh, less yeah. this year than last year. There are more Android phones on the show floor. But 3G last year was unusable. It's mostly unusable now. But here's an interesting thing. And one of the things we're using, AT&T's LTE 4G is here. We're yep. using 4G cards as well. In the live view? Yeah, we are. And what's neat about that is nobody has a phone that supports it yet. There's only <laughs> a handful. So there's not nearly the competition for LTE. Uh, that that's, might help us out. Uh, on, on this particular uh, right, right. Uh, thing, I, I tell you, we're using the little mini uh, live view, and it's it's working great. I'm excited. Are we? Which we are using 4G in it, aren't we? Which which 4Gs are we using? All three, T-Mobile, Verizon, and AT&T. And I think that's going to help us because I don't think that these are widely used right now out in the real world. So <laughs> we hope we get a better. I'm not sure I'd call this the real world. <laughs> <laughs> this is so far not the real world. It's, you know, I, I, I run into people all the time as I walk around who are here for their first time, yeah. and they're all wide-eyed. Oh, it's amazing. You, we try to communicate the range and variety of stuff, uh, but the, 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 the small screen, the camera, cannot. You need, it's, it's just a huge. And everywhere you turn, there's more stimulus, there's new stuff, there's shiny toys. It's just overwhelming. Um, the LG booth is ahead. We're yep. passing through. The JVC booth is over to our left. Uh, I love the colors here that are uh, being that are in the booth of uh, I MGO. I don't know who that is. I don't know who MGO is either. But. Yeah. That's the other thing is you see companies that... Who are they? Right next to companies that, oh, I know who they yeah, are. Yeah, they've been here for decades. One of the things Dish announced, which I think is very interesting, oh, yes. this is, is their great. hopper service. Yes, this is fantastic. So I, I remember <laughs> I remember Hugh Hefner. <laughs> and, uh, I one do, too. The, yes, one of the things Hugh Hefner did in the Playboy Mansion that was the height of cool is he had VCRs in the basement recording every broadcast channel yep. so that at all any time, ta all the time. And he had engineers down there, so anytime he wanted to watch a show, he could watch it. This is the days before, we you know, VCRs were, were either very new or barely out there. Uh, Dish very is going to do the same thing. This yeah. Hopper service is a, is a, is a, 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 DVR. a, a DVR with two or three two terabytes, terabytes. Two terabytes in it, which means they can record 2,000 hours. They're going to record every hour of every primetime show on every the four night. major networks: so ABC, CBS, NBC, you, and Fox. You don't have to say, "Oh, I want to see that show." I, I got to remember. Record. Yeah, I got to remember to to set it up. It's Hugh Hefner in your basement, <laughs> in a box, in a box, so in that, a kangaroo. They, They've got this whole kangaroo theme going you can on. See so the it's giant uh, kangaroo out front. Here's the uh, here's the kangaroo on the. Oh yeah, there he is right on the now. stage, right? Yeah. So I think this is very intriguing. Uh, and I, you know, if, if, if Dish is doing it, I imagine it will be available soon from in a variety of DVR services. Because, right. Uh, now, what you have to do, of course, you have to have four tuners. Right. And uh, and for a satellite, that means you know you have to have a more elaborate dish and you have to have a more elaborate uh, box. So I don't expect this will be the budget price that uh, Dish is not famous at, for. Yeah, certainly not at first. 
But uh, I as can far imagine TiVo and everybody else. Why not? I mean, what a sure, great idea! Just sure. record everything. Just record everything. Now that hard drive space is so cheap, exactly. You know, you exactly. can put two terabytes yep. in there for not very much. And so we're at the LG uh, booth. Yes, we're going to find hopefully our con LG. Our con our like contact actually a number of companies is massive. It's uh, it's a, a Korean company. It used to be Lucky Gold Star. That was the original name. They were in the back of the, uh, the, the drugstore selling the cheapest TVs you could buy. Yep. yep. At some point, somebody smart said, "You know what? We want to be a high-end brand." Samsung did the same thing. Another Korean company that was in the back of drugstores, and both companies now are dominant. Dominant. In the, the television industry, the phone industry. LG's got a whole bunch of phones over here. Um, they're doing smart TVs, and I want to I want to take a look at their uh, Google TV and Absolutely. Smart TV because, in Absolutely. my opinion, this is another one to watch. Absolutely, no question about it. Uh, and they're and also doing a whole ecosystem thing with tablets and smartphones and and refrigerators <laughs> and washer dryers. The smart refrigerator <laughs> and the smart washer dryer. Your television. <laughs> got your. Well, how did that go? We got to move these refrigerators. refrigerators. We got, got to, to move, move these color, color TVs. <laughs> 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 oh God, I got a musician. <laughs> now, let's pick up our 3D glasses, because this yeah. is the other thing that is really cool. Uh, LG has the biggest wall. We showed this when we started uh, our day yesterday. This is when you first come into the Central Hall. You come into this giant LG cinema. It's in 3D. And I, and I have to say, out a million glasses. as much as I hate the 3D experience, yeah. when you get a screen this big exactly. and you're standing in front of it, you said that, that IMAX was the real way to experience it 3D. It really is. This is more than IMAX. This is <laughs> oh, seriously more. <laughs> ginormous Max and a very dramatic. And I have to say, it is actually quite beautiful. I don't it know is. how many monitors they've uh, incorporated into that big display. Hopefully they'll tell us, but... Uh, it's fun because, when you, you know, it actually causes a log jam. People come in the main entrance of, of CES. That's right. And this is the first thing they see, and they stop and gawk. There's just people standing there with their mouth a, a, a gap, staring at this display. It's incredible. It's also pretty loud, so if, if, the, <laughs> if you can't hear us, that's why. Like CES, it's an assault on the senses. Everything yes, about exactly CES right. is an assault on the senses. So I. Uh, oh I, no! Watch out! Oh, oh. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and you know me, I hate 3D. I know. Actually, though, I, know. I have to say I feel a little bit vindicated because, uh, unlike the year before and uh, the year before that, this is not the year of 3D at CES. Correct. And I that think what correct. we are, in fact, seeing 3D is kind of in these TVs, but they're not pushing it. And I think what they what we're seeing is that that it didn't really get the traction that they had hoped with. That last 2011 was a terrible year for televisions. They weren't selling these flat panels, and I think their attention has moved from 3D to applications to smart TV. To smart TV. That is, this year the CES show is all about smart TV, and 4K, which we'll see as well. And the challenge is that I think most people in the U.S. who wanted HD TVs have bought them, and uh, we don't buy new TVs every year. We no. buy them maybe every five years. Unlike computers, right? Which we and buy so every couple of years. Companies like LG that want to uh, get you in, back into the store are going to have to offer something that really grabs you. 3D was going to be it. I don't think it was it. Uh, 3D TV sales are high, but that's only only it, because it is all increasing. The TVs have them. But because all TVs have them, that's right. exactly right. So they right. can claim a higher adoption rate right. than HD TV when it first started. But it's because they just put it in the TV, and when you bought a TV, it had it. So the adoption rate, the sales rate, was very high. Well, and this is another point to make. Uh, most of the 3D TVs that we saw in previous years used active glasses. Yes. It's Expensive, interesting. big, bulky. LG's require pushing these real D style passive, passive glasses. glasses. Simple, cheap. You can outfit your whole family for you know less than a hundred bucks. That was a big problem. You get a TV yeah. with one or two active glasses, and it's going to cost you more than a hundred dollars to get. Another pair, and the yep. family has three people or four people. Yep. And what if you have a Super Bowl party? Yeah, you I can't. mean, it's ridiculous. You so, can't. So I, I do think that while uh, 3D, you know, on a screen like this is pretty compelling, I don't know if it's going to. I don't know if it really took off. Now I will tell you this: in terms of 3D, um, Panasonic is sponsoring 200 hours of 3D coverage of the Olympics this summer. Yeah, that might be cool. That, that I think might will be, worth be cool. Watching, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. LG right now is showing its smart TV. Uh, Hilton, you might want to grab this. Although that's in 3D, isn't it? So let me give you the glasses, <laughs> and then uh, you'll see how. Uh, <laughs> Can it? Does it work? <laughs> Have we got somebody? There you go. They're showing uh, that they've got uh, this uh, remote control that works like 
a Wiimote. It, uh, it senses its position in space and lets you move around. And that works pretty well. I'll be darned. Folks, you're getting 3D on 2D. How do we do it? It's the magic of Hilton Goring. Actually, I think that's in 2D. <laughs> look at all the apps, though, and that's uh, look at that's, that. Yeah, that's oh, look really at that. what they're pushing here. It's apps, and we're going we're about to go see the, their Google TV implementation. Good, I really want to see that, and the 55-inch OLED. You know, it's right over there. We could just walk over. I know where it uh, is. Well, okay. So, uh, as usual with CES, there's a lot of. Okay, uh, good. All right, here we go. Okay. I've got my glasses, just in case. Uh, the OLED is, is 3D capable, of course. We, we are in uh, the second day of CES, which usually is a little slower than the first day. But I have to say, at least here in the LG booth, the oh, crowds are just as thick as ever. Thick as ever. We, Jeff, we are, how you doing, man? We've got people ice breaking for us going through the, uh, going through the place. And it, while, how you while doing? It, this is amazing, isn't it? They give you those clip ons for glasses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pass Passive is working really, really well. Yeah, we just, we we just talked to Elliot. Yeah, yeah. I bet. Incredible. Yeah. See, you guys later. All right. See you later. Oh, duh. He just kicked a soccer ball in my face. Oh, man. Oh, did you see Are you that? okay? Did you, get, did you get hit? Okay. You're starting to, I'm starting to like 3D better. That really <laughs> did feel like it was coming straight at me. Of course, the screen is like 30 feet tall. Right, exactly. Do you All remember right. this? I know you weren't. You didn't really like the 3D in Hugo. Did you like the movie as a movie? Well, that's the problem I had is that I was you so were distracted, distracted by wearing glasses, by the fact that it was dim, by the smudges on the glasses. Yeah. It took me out of the movie. I'm I did really like sorry. The movie, the movie, movie. Was, is excellent. And I, I wish I'd seen it in 2D. And, uh, and the, and reason, I I, the reason I bring it, is, bring it up is that with the ball coming right at you, it reminds me of the scene of the very first oh. movie that was ever made well, of a train the coming train. into a station and the audience jumping out of their seats thinking just that did. a train was coming. And, and that you was just not did a that. feigned reaction because you really feel like this thing is coming straight at you with a big screen like this. Uh, it's, it, the 3D is good. The quality is good. So uh, are, we, are we... We're just standing we're, okay. here. Well, then we're, we're, here we are. We're going this way now. All right. We're moving. We're going to, believe it or take not, we're going to try and get into... This reminds me so much of the House of Wax picture that you see. <laughs> yeah, right. Everybody, everybody with their 3D, 3D glasses, glasses on. And their mouths open. At least, it's, at least it's not anaglyph, red, blue. No, I have to say. You know, which you is... Know, this is fairly bright. I don't feel like it's as dim uh, as it was, for instance, in Hugo. No. I, is this real D? What do they use? They're, this is real D. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but each of these, these, these are the each individual are so panels. LEDs now, that's why 4K is so important, because instead of having the uh, HD resolution and having to dim it by yes. doing two screens, when you've got 4K, you can have two full brightness you, you have the same amount of pixels as a HD screen. Correct. E each of them. E for for each eye, eye. Yeah. yeah. And exactly. And of course, when you have this many screens, the brightness is quite good. It's huge. Um, so we're uh, we're going to try and get through this. This, uh, this is a very popular display. It's yes. the world's largest 3D OLED TV, organic light emitting diode. We've talked about OLEDs before. OLEDs, unlike LCDs, are reflective. They're not no no they're no they're emissive. They're emissive. In they, other words, they emit their own light. Not reflective. I'm sorry. Yes. yes. And uh, LCD, the way they work is there's a light behind the shutter. The L the liquid crystal twists to open up the shutter and let and more let or less through. light through. Right. These are actually emissive pixels, much like your CRT, where they're Correct. they're glowing. Correct. And, and as a result, when it's black, it's black. Really black. And uh, the color seems like it's alive. It's vibrant. Um, these TVs really grab you. Uh, just as, you know, people have seen OLEDs now, I think in widespread use, of course, in cell phones. It, small, so we, smaller screens, they work very well, we, but we up till now, it's like. been very difficult to get really large screens. The other thing that's very interesting about this, and I guess it's because you don't have to have backlighting. So Correct. So you can make these incredibly thin, incredibly four millimeters thin. thick. Hilton, we showed this yesterday when we came in, but I'll, let you, I'll ask you to get that shot again of the, of the very thin screen. Also, the bezel is tiny. Tiny. It's almost bezel-less. Can, uh, can we get inside there, or so once uh, once our uh, once our host gets in here, we'll be able to do it. Now I asked them. The electronics are, of course, in the base, right? Because there's no room for the electronics on the panel in, itself. In a four millimeter thick thing, right? Yeah. But that's okay. It's just something to remember as you're mounting it uh, that you'll need some way to get the wires out of the screen 
uh, either into the wall and down or, or somewhere. Well, I bet you it's got some wireless uh, capabilities going on. Yeah. Michael, how are you? Good, how are you? Leo Laporte from Twit. Michael Alessi from LG Electronics. Very nice to see you. This is Scott Wilkinson. Hey, how you doing? We're Good. doing our Home Theater Geeks show, and uh, we're here to see the OLED. The massive OLED. Yeah, so this year at 2012 CES, LG is introducing 55-inch 3D OLED TV. So it's the world's largest 3D OLED TV. Um, benefit of OLED TV in comparison to a conventional LED TV is that it the, the pixels are light emitting, so they emit their own light. So you're able to get rid of all the backlights that are needed in any conventional LED TV or LCD TV, and you're able to achieve four millimeter See, we weren't lying, folks, when we told you. <laughs> so four millimeters. Um, also, the benefits of OLED is that since they can turn on and off themselves, you get the deepest blacks, the, deep, the whitest whites. The contrast ratio is infinite. So the, the pixels are actually turning off, and you're getting an actual black pixel. So The contrast ratio is infinite. Now, this, you, sometimes when they say that, I go, yeah, right. But in this case, it really is. because the, the black is true black. The contrast ratio is, is actually calculated by the white level divided by the black level. And when the black level it's is zero, zero the, uh, the result is zero. infinity. <laughs> right. And, and so also, because the pixels can turn on and off themselves, you get a much faster response time. So no it. motion so lag, no motion blur of LCD? Virtually none. So a conventional LED LCD is usually about three to five millisecond response time. This is giving you a point or less than 0.02 response time. So it's much like a CRT in that sense. It's fast, it's bright, uh, and I gotta say the resolution is fantastic. But one of the reasons we haven't seen these up to now is they've been very difficult to make in this size. We've seen OLEDs in smaller sizes. What happened that made it possible to make these so big screens? We're using uh, four pixel sub-pixels. Um, so we use red, green, blue, and white sub-pixels in each pixel. So it's able to achieve a higher success rate of manufacturing, so we're able to mass produce and get out in the market for home use. Now, have you solved the problem of a blue OLED in particular and its relatively short lifespan? We have. I mean, these TVs are rated at 30,000 hour lifespan, so six hours a day, 40 years. You're going to replace the TV three times before it, it dies. Right. And that's right on par with all our other LED TVs, so no loss of life. And because it's so thin, it's about half the weight of a, a conventional LED, 55-inch LED. And uh, in, internally, some of the features you get, you're getting, uh, first and foremost, it's a great 2D TV. It's also 3D functionality. So we have the Cinema 3D. I saw you had your glasses on before. Light, comfortable, inexpensive. You get six pairs. In and because these are so bright, you really don't get that dimming effect. I mean, it's some dimming, but it's, it's bright enough. Right, right. So you get a brighter picture. So you get all the benefits of Cinema 3D from LG, and you also get all our, the benefits of our upgraded UI in our smart TV system this year. So all your Netflix, Vudu, streaming services. We're going to look at that in just a second. Yeah, exactly. One right. problem I've always had with sub-pixel rendering is pixelation. That you can there's sometimes visible color noise. This actually I don't see that. It looks very good. Yeah, there's there's none no no visible color noise or pixelation or anything. I mean, you, you can watch the whole clip through. You you probably won't find much of anything if you do. Now is this going to this is going to be available this year, right? It is. It'll be available second half of this year, third quarter time frame probably. No pricing right now. I know that question was coming up. That's the question. Uh, That's the next but, question. But it will be available this year. Now, LG makes panels for a lot of other companies. Is this only going to be for LG, or will other companies license this? Uh, for right now, it's it's LG um, only. I I know a couple competitors have OLED technology. Seems like though we have the the top of the pack in OLED. Well, we'll go over to Samsung. We'll take we a look. We will. We will. We'll take a look. But I have to say, and, and of course, all of the content that they're showing has a lot of black in it, which really right. highlights how deep and rich the blacks are. Um, uh, it, it really is spectacular looking. I, it is. It is. Yeah. Nice job. Thank you, Thank you Michael. Thank all you for your time. We appreciate it. No problem. All right. All right. Thanks so look much. At look, Ugh, at look at that rose. Look at that rose. Look at Red is traditionally very difficult to do in video. In fact, you're looking at it, but I doubt you're seeing it because, of course, uh, even with our high def cameras and uh, and it's uh, not <laughs> transmitting not, the exact same we're, red. We're not, able, and we don't know what you're watching it right, on. Exactly, uh, right, exactly. But I have to say, it is. Uh, if you get a chance to see one of these, the and I hope you do, the is stunning. Absolutely, they, get, they really kind of have to rely on our review because I I, I just don't think that this transmits. Look at that green. Now, I have to say, I can't wait to get one in the studio and do a measurement and see well, if the colors are accurate to where they're supposed to be in terms of the 
uh, broadcast standard and the reproduction standard. You know, traditionally, I feel like with OLED, the colors are hyper real. They yes. are not accurate. Right. Uh, they are too bright and uh, and too colorful. Yes. Um, not well, that which I'm sure they are like here. That. No, no. In fact, I was talking to somebody the other day, uh, a calibrator, a dealer, who said uh, that his some of his friends. When they get the TV home, they turn it back into vivid mode because yeah. that's what they want. Yeah, people like this brightness. Um, I w the other thing I would love to do is put an all-white screen on there and see what kind of pixelation, screen door effects, yes. sub-pixel uh, rendering effects yep. that we see. Yep. And I think, I'm sure they're showing all that black because of the deep blacks, but it may also be that they're not going to put a full white screen on there because that's where you might see some of the pixelation. I, I don't see any. Uh, you can see line, horizontal lines. You can see uh, them if you're up close if enough. You get but very close, but no worse than any other TV I've ever used. No, no, no. And, and far better than most. And, and the boy, when they go to black, oh, that thing is. It's so delicious. It disappears. It's amazing. Yeah, that's really It's great. amazing. In a black room, that thing would truly look like it was turned off. See, Scott, it seems to me, and, and this is what I said about 4K as well. Forget 3D. You want to get people buying new TVs, you've got to get a TV that they can look at and immediately say, that is qualitatively better than what I've got now. 3D didn't do that. Yeah. This does. I yeah. think this is the kind of TV that will get people back in the stores. And I hope manufacturers realize that. Well, and, uh, you know, the go. first ones, of course, are going to be expensive. He said there's no pricing yet, and I'm sure that's true. Well, we've but heard anywhere from 5 to, to 10. 10. Now, five, five to ten thousand dollars. That's not so bad. That's if you right. Look at the top of the line plasmas now, or the Sharp Elite, for example. The Elite, that's six. Sixty inch for sixty five hundred. So um, if it's five, I would buy one. Absolutely. Ten, ten I'll wait. I'll wait. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. It's but worth it. I'll tell you, for five for five grand, it's like worth everything it. else. This is a technology that's going to start out expensive and get cheaper as mass production ramps up. And uh, so it is going to find its way into more and more homes. This, to me, has almost as much appeal as 4K because when you're looking at something, you just feel like you are there. It very, it's very c real. It's like looking out a window. You like looking out a window. I thought that was Vancouver. I, it looked familiar. <laughs> Vancouver is okay, a good city for that. Where are we going next? We're going to go to this Google. So much fun. Google TV, I hope, or, or smart yeah, TV. The over LG this way. has made a smart TV. There are a number of smart TVs here. In fact, Lenovo has one that's not Google TV. It's using Android Ice Cream Sandwich 4.0. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, but it's but it's not Google TV. Uh, this is actually Google TV built into the TV and with a remote, a unique remote that uh, I think people are going to like. So there it is over here, straight ahead. Straight ahead. Where it says sports. We want smart TV with Google TV. Thanks. So we literally have three people breaking the crowd. For Hilton, Hilton who's run, backwards. walking backwards. Yeah. He's the Ginger Rogers. Fantastic of the job. Yeah, that's right. He's everybody, not wearing everybody, heels. But. Everybody applauds Fred Astaire, <laughs> but Ginger had to do it all the same, but backwards and in heels. So here we go. Okay, yeah. let's see if we got somebody to talk to here. We've been here once before. We'll get a factory rep to uh, give us a demo. Um, if I can somebody? find the remote. Oh, there it is over there. Well, once once we get him over here, we'll we'll get a demo. Peter gave us a demo once. Here we We're go. back, Peter. Peter. We're Scott back. Wilkinson. We Hi. want we want more. Hi, Peter. How are you? So you're doing a full Google TV in here. We are. This year, uh, LG is offering Google 2.0. Really, it's it's. I can't tell you the amount of innovation that's gone on here. It's a factor of function and form. What we're offering right now is a dual core processor, and this is leverage. Dual core. Dual core. So lots of power. 1.2 gigahertz. So I don't know that. It's a good question. It is an LG uh, L9 chipset processor. So that's so it's ARM, ARM based. It is ARM based. Dual core. Wow. And then the remote functionality is really where I like it. Go ahead, Leo. Yeah, you know we uh, we showed you this yesterday, uh, and of course the Sony uh, 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 Google TV remote was this size, but it was clunky and difficult. This is simple. I like the fact that there's so few buttons. I always like that. And of course, with Google TV, one of the advantages is you can have a keyboard because you can type in a search for a show on any platform. And Having a keyboard is so much better than you know scrolling you can tweet, around a screen. You can surf. Um, this is the new Google TV, as you said, 2.0. It's a honeycomb interface, which puts the icons along the bottom. You've added to it though it's better than in my logitech review this looks good we did you know one of the key things is that user interface so we always want to leverage you know that lg is offering cinema 3d capability so we'll offer some 3d uh, zones we'll also have bookmarks so it's great for optimizing so the 3d is actually video it's actually in 3D, video in 3d youtube style i mean it's coming from the web it's coming from the web it's actually coming it's an aggregate from google 
where this is coming from. And if I want to see immediate 3D content on demand, this gives me a great place to be able to go out and grab that. The other thing I like is that you've incorporated the TV's settings into the apps, which makes it much easier for me to configure the television. It's I a agree. much more graphical interface. Yeah, it's just, you know, we really approach this from an end user point of view. We right. wanted it to be much easier to, to navigate back and forth through that. I think we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but I wanted to expand on that. You know, any of the apps that I've got on the TV, I can customize that bottom launcher bar. So I'm not obligated to stay with just what's on screen. If I want an immediate access to Angry Birds, we can put that up. Right, right. It plays Angry Birds? It does play Angry Birds. <laughs> They're not letting me play Angry Birds today. <laughs> You'd never stop. I other, the other thing I like about Google TV, uh, or uh, in this case uh, on an LG, is your live TV is still there. So you're not exiting live TV to go to an interface. You still have... CNN still have playing. it up in the corner you still there. have that McCaffrey bozo up there. No, I'm sorry. I, I like Jack. He's up there. And you, you're not losing the audio. You're not losing the TV, but you're able to then browse and find other things. And it's, I think that's a really nice interface for users. I like that. I like that a lot. One of the other things is as I'm exploring an app or as I'm exploring on the web, we're not going to be able to show it here. But as the when the unit comes to market, I'm able to bring up a picture in picture so I can see what's going on with live TV. And while you're tweeting or while you're browsing. Tweeting. Yeah. I do that all the time. I want to go to IMDb and find out who, you know, who was in this movie. Right, right. And the movie continues. You're still watching, but you have access to it or you're tweeting and you still have access to it. Now, last year you showed us remotes that were, uh, that were spatial at a gyro. I mean, does this work that way too? So what we're offering is um, uh, two accelerometers and it's working off an RF protocol on that. It's um, RF. It is RF. So that, that's important because if it were infrared, you'd have to point it at the thing. And when you're doing this, sometimes it's hard to point it at. Now you notice, look, uh, I don't know if you can see this, Hilton, but as I move the uh, remote control, the mouse is moving around. So this is a mouse, it's but I don't mouse. need a surface. No, no. It's, uh, it's really, really great. Have you played Angry Birds with that? I haven't played Angry Birds, but here's why I like it. If I'm cranked back in the chair with right. my lazy boy, right. I don't have to raise my arm it's up over experience. my chest. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, if you're yeah. Evan yeah. Forfend, you should raise your arm. You never want to have to raise your so arm. So when I relax, I get really relaxed. Now, do we have, um, uh, what was I going to say, oh, voice recognition as well? So one of the things that you're able to do on your Android phones, on your Android tablets, on any of your Apple or Mac products is you can download that Google TV app and take advantage of that voice control. On our remote controls that we come with out of the box for Google TV, it's going to offer the QWERTY and the Magic Motion. Other TVs that we'll offer this year outside of the Google TV platform will offer that voice recognition. And the microphone would be where? Would it be in the remote? So it would be in the remote, but it won't be for Google TV, Got unfortunately. It. Got it. Yeah. That's yeah. going to converge. That'll all be there. Oh, yeah, that, it will. Exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, isn't there also something to say about... Um, taking content from one device, say a tablet, and putting it on the TV and back and forth, and the whole ecosystem becoming much more integrated this year. That is, you know, leveraging this year with the Plex app um, that's out there, any of the digital content, so my movies, my music, my JPEGs, I can take right off of my tablet, as long as I've got the app uh, running for Plex on my TV, I can take that right off and transfer it over. I can also do that for my computer as well. So it's amazing when you think about where this technology is headed across the board. Really strong applications. So you have an Android app here. You have an Android phone there. It would require Android, uh, right? Or can you do this with iOS as well? You can do this as well with iOS. Oh, my goodness. That's Naturally, great. we prefer that maybe you take a look at an <laughs> LG tablet yeah, or an yeah. LG phone. Yeah. Wow. Well, this and, is one of the neat. stories of the show, I think. Aside from OLED and smart TV and apps and so on, is this whole integrated ecosystem. Right. We're seeing this from all the companies right. that are offering tablets, certainly of their own. They're saying, oh, well, you you know, Sony, should you should use a Sony tablet, or Samsung, you should use a Samsung tablet. But ultimately, they're LG the same. So it's DLNA, which is an industry standard, or well, no? So we'll offer DLNA. DLNA on our smart TV platforms for okay. Google, because we're sensitive to copyright issues, we'll leverage our Plex capabilities with Google TV. Plex is great. Plex I, I'm, is I'm a big fun. fan of Plex, yeah. That's interesting. So now Plex is an open source project. So I like it. Yeah, you're incorporating that in. That's great. That's really neat. Peter, thank you so much. Leo, it's always good to see you. My wife thinks that I've got a secret crush on you. I'm here to tell <laughs> not you it's, secret not, now. it's not a secret. <laughs> Peter, thank you so much. You too, I thank you so, so much. I am so excited. I think these are beautiful TVs, and I think just having apps in here, it just makes so much more sense than adding a box. I was at first against it because I thought updating and so forth, right. but these update, these are computers. They're it's got computers. a dual core processor. That's around, right. You know? That's right. You could do everything a computer could do. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Oh, boy, what okay. next? Where well, do we go next?
Oh, uh, we could do it. The 84 inch. Let's 4K. do the 4K. Before While we do that, here. I would like to mention some uh, very important people. Please do. The folks at Ford. Oh thank yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, because they're sponsoring this event, and they they made some big announcements at CES, including some big announcements about electric vehicles. You know, oh, I've been yeah? waiting for that 2012 electric. Oh, man, I, no kidding. I, we were lucky. In fact, if you go to our Twitch specials, you can see our interview with Alan Mulally, the CEO of Ford. Uh, I also had dinner with him last night and had a chance to talk with him about what Ford is doing. And one of the questions, it was a roundtable of journalists that uh, the journalists asked him is, uh, you know, Ford's a little slow to the game, the electric a car game. Yeah. How come? And he said, because we didn't want to just make one kind of concept electric car as the other manufacturers have done. Right. We electrify our whole line. No kidding. So ultimately, the goal that Ford has, and they're getting, they're already kind of almost there, is that every car they make, the assembly line, 70% of the parts are the same. At any point in that assembly line, they can change the drivetrain from gas, diesel, electric, hybrid, plug-in hybrid. It's just a flip of a switch. Wow. And so they can match demand exactly, and they plan to do it across almost all of their car lines. That's incredible. And that's the way to do it. It's to, it's yeah, to yeah. really make electric possible for everybody. These electric cars. Now, uh, the 2012 Focus uh, was announced uh, last year. This year they announced the 2013 C-Max Energy plug-in hybrid. I like plug-in hybrid because here's what you do. You plug it in. Yep. You charge it up. Charges in a couple charge of hours. Battery, yeah. 240 volts if you have one of the special chargers. By the way, you could, they are offering those chargers at the dealer. They're called um, Value Charging. Oh, no, that's something else. I got the name here. Uh, maybe it's on page two. Maybe it's There's on page two. There is a lot of information. Uh, yeah, it's the uh, Leviton charging stations, 240 volt. Yeah. Easy, it's an easy, very simple conversion to make. It'll fully charge the Ford Focus Electric in three to four hours, which is unbelievable. If you've got the hybrid, what you can do, uh, plug-in hybrid, is you charge it up. You'll get about 15 miles range. Uh, and then... The engine kicks in, and you can continue to go. So if you're just going around town, you'll all be all electric. If you need the engine, you've got the engine for longer range. They're saying it equivalently 100 miles per gallon because Holy of this smokes. support. I think that's just fantastic. Oh, it is fantastic. Yeah, lithium-ion batteries, of course. Um, zero emissions. That's really great. Uh, you can top off the battery without uh, changing the life expectancy does, of the battery. Does the oh so the recycle system? Don't uh, have to do that. You just plug yeah. it in whenever you need whenever to. You so need you get to. back. Does it you get charged? Does it charge while you're driving on the? It gas? does. It has regenerative charging Excellent. as well. So when you put on the brakes, instead of that friction and heat and energy being lost, right. it, it goes, goes right into back into the, the battery. battery. Right. Fantastic. It's a it's a very smart system. Yeah, yeah. Um, they also have done a really neat thing. They have apps, so you can in your phone, your smartphone, your Android or your iPhone or your BlackBerry, you can see the charge state of your car you can be in your living room and you could say you see what's going on in the car in yeah. the garage <laughs> you can turn on charging they even have a smart charging more and more utilities are changing their rates depending on peak hours right and your car can be smart enough to say I'm not charging till it's cheap and it really brings the cost down significantly Fantastic. they're just they, the technology they're putting in there is great I asked Alan I said uh, are geeks important to you? <laughs> and he lit up. Yeah. He said, I love CES. I love geeks. I love coming and talking to you guys because you guys get what we're doing. We're, turn we're making these cars 21st century vehicles. And he, he is such an inspiring guy because he talked about the legacy of Ford, the history of Ford. Oh, yeah. He admitted that, yeah, we went through a bad time when we weren't making great cars. And he even quoted, and probably they don't want me to do this in the app, but I'm going to say it anyway, because Alan even said, you know, sometimes people use, say, Ford stands for, um, I can't remember, uh, found on road dead. He said, when I hear people say that, it breaks my heart. He yeah. said, we're polishing the blue oval. We're reinventing the company. And I think it's, I think he has reinvented the company to make an amazing car company. Well, if these, <coughs> if these, uh, points or any indication I would I'm say really absolutely. excited I'm really excited uh, I what you know I have to say I was gonna I was in, I'm on the list to buy the uh, 2012 electric focused and then they unveiled here the 2013 oh, fusion so have you seen gonna, it no I haven't I wish go over and look yeah, at yeah, it yeah it is beautiful it's their mid-size body so I think it's they're a nice here in Central car. Hall they have it and uh, it's got the plug-in hybrid available I'm very excited that won't be till later this fall anyway take a look at a Ford at your Ford dealer it's it is the car manufacturer of the century, I have to say. I'm so proud to be associated with him. Ford.com slash technology to learn more or just drive one today at a Ford dealer near you. We thank him so much for uh, being our partners here at CES. So All right, we're going to go take a quick look at 4K. 4K, I can't wait. Okay, Hi, we're going to leave. How are you?
Good, great. We're having fun. Did you see the OLED uh, display of it? Oh, wow, does that look good. So our last stop yeah, at, I want one right uh, at LG now. here yeah. is uh, but an now we're going to see something even better looking. display, which is uh, 38, 40 uh, pixels across by 2160 pixels down, four times the number of pixels as a conventional okay. L L uh, HD TV. Hilton's been walking backwards. Let's walk backwards we'll now. Walk backwards. Let him walk forwards. Okay. So we're going to walk. I don't know what's behind me. I don't know what's going to happen. Well, Liz is we're behind just, you. So we're uh, just, she's the icebreaker. We're just going to keep okay. walking backwards. As we, how do you like this, Hilton? This is good, huh? Whoa. For a change, we'll walk backwards. Now we know how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> we're walking over to the oh, 4K display, man. as you said. Um, this is something that I see every year at CES. The problem with 4K, or the thing that's wrong with 4K is, you don't care about 4K on a 40-inch, 50-inch, even maybe even on a 60-inch display. That's right. You need a big display That's right. to really, to really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Not to mention the fact you need 4K content, which is the which we don't have yet. Well, but we didn't have 3D content. We didn't have we didn't, we didn't have, have HD. HD content this at is first. Normal. Right. Now you're gonna have to put on your glasses for this. This is the world's largest 84-inch ultra definition. TV, and that's what they're going to call 4K from now 4K, on. 4K, yeah, ultra, ultra definition. definition. And it is 3D. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, those droplets are coming right at me. Now, it is 3D, and the passive 3D, and the advantage of passive 3D in this case is that each eye is only seeing half the resolution, but half the resolution of 4K is still full HD. Right. So, so when we put the glasses on, in effect, we're not seeing 4K, we're seeing HD TV. Correct. Correct. But it's so much finer detail right. that it really solves that problem of, uh, of passive 3D in a 1080p set. In a way, to me, it's unfortunate because we don't really get to see the value of the 4K in a situation well, like maybe this. Well, maybe if they'll they put start on showing some, some 2D real content, then you'll really see it. It actually, when you look at it without the glasses, it looks somewhat pixelated or more like interlaced because I'm going to go see if I can get them to put some real 4K on. <laughs> Hang on a second. Look, at, he's off on a mission to put 4K on this TV. I don't know if they're going to do it because I think that they probably uh, are really more interested in showing off 3D here. Um, it looks like he's getting a rejection. I don't know. And you don't really, what you're seeing is the... Uh, the weird dual display that people see when they're looking at 3D without the glasses. We may be out of uh, out of luck on this one. Although I have to say, if if 3D and the desire to get a full resolution, bright 3D display drives manufacturers to make more 4K displays, I'm all for it because when you get it home, you could watch, if you could uh, find it, 4K content. If you've never seen 4K content, it's spectacular, but you do need a display that's 84 inches or, or thereabouts to take advantage of it. Sadly, they're not going to put native 4K on because there is no native 4K content <laughs> available to the consumer, and they're, right. they're really targeting this to be a commercial product. Did you get a price point for this? I mean, that's a no, they're I, trying to sell this, huh? Yes, they are. They are trying to sell this. 84 inches. That is yeah. huge. Now, in the Sharp booth, which is where we're going next, we they'll will have real 4K. We'll, they'll have there. real 4K content right, over well, there. Well, let's take a walk. We're at the LG booth. You're watching Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson. I uh, don't usually get to talk along on Home Theater Geeks, but, oh, this but I'm so happy you're here. It's always fun. You I bet. Love it. They're showing 3D gaming over here. There's a you know, when you talk about the 2012 Olympics or games, there are some sensible applications for 3D and I think those are two of them that's exactly right so we're we're uh, heading out the back way just because the front way is way don't too forget crowded. to return your 3D glasses okay we're gonna put our 3D do glasses you own right your here. own 3D glasses? I do I do and I take them with me I've uh, got to do that we, we could, probably this way is easier Scott knows his way around here. I do know my way around this hall I've we're been going here down the back this is my 21st CES is it really yep. Wow Yep. TVs and, it's, and it home never, theater have always been a part of CES. It has. It's Go, been a it, big the, part. The VCR was introduced at CES. Yes. I mean, this is this has always been the, that kind of show. And it's funny if you if you've been going that many years, you've probably seen some amazing uh, transformations over the well, years. Okay, we're going to swing around here. We're going to let Hilton start walking backwards again. We didn't do a very good job of walking backwards. No, so we didn't. Hilton. Hilton's He's so pro. much better at it. Yeah, exactly right. We're going to end up going back through the the big LG display entry, and you'll hear the pounding bass once again. 
I do. That's the thing that made me jump, by the way. That if you're watching in 3D glasses, that guy comes straight at you. Yeah, and it scared and you the jumped. heck. I did. I literally you, jumped. You literally jumped. And then it there was, was a soccer ball that uh, almost hit me, and I. <laughs> yep, I've seen a few changes over the last 21 years. But what hasn't changed is the crowds. <laughs> it's always <laughs> been this crowded. I mean, last year, last two years have been maybe a little less, but not much. You know, I was looking back at my old posts from CES, and in 2008. I wrote a post, I called it the craptask, craptastic electronics show <laughs> because it seemed to be all cheesy, chintzy gadgets. We were in a kind of a dead phase yeah. uh, before these TVs started to really take off. And I was underwhelmed by it. And I said, you know, attendance was down, the number of booths was down. And I said, I don't, I think this is going the way of Comdex, but boy, was I wrong. <laughs> uh, that was kind of the, the ebb, the low uh, year. Yeah, exactly. And uh, things have really turned around for CES. Now, I have to say, this year, there are 100 fewer uh, exhibitors. 20, really? Yeah, 2,700 instead of 2,800. Okay. But they've kind of augmented that by bringing the PMA show, the Photo Marketing Association show in. That added another 500 uh, photography booths to, to uh, CES. I did hear that the attendance, the I think it might be a record is, attendance. Is was going to be higher than ever. Yeah, a record attendance. I think they, they're they're aiming at 150,000 uh, people here. Yeah, this, at this least. Year. Now, uh, at its peak, Comdex and maybe even CES would get as high as 200,000, 180,000, 200,000. But I, I think that 150,000 is plenty. <laughs> In fact, yeah. it's too many. Well, I'll tell you this for sure. Uh, my journalistic colleagues are all complaining that Internet access at the hotels and here is very hard. Sure, because all the geeks are using their smartphones and their laptops. And, and yet we're supposed to be posting constantly. Right. <laughs> I don't envy you. I have to say that. It's very That's one tough. thing that has changed. Now we're in the Panasonic booth. Panasonic, of course, another one of the you know, top of the line, first tier uh, television manufacturers. That's right. Uh, are they still doing plasmas? Or are they? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. no. They're, they've, they've increased their LCD. Uh, I think they've even announced this. They're, they're continuing to increase the size of their LCDs. It used to be that they, when the LCDs stopped at 37 inches, the, pan, the plasmas started. Right. So there wasn't much overlap. Now there's some overlap. A I lot of overlap. I think their LCDs are getting up to uh, possibly 50, 55 inches. Wow. Well, so, this is the same thing they did last year. This is the kind of the 3D pit. Um, not, you know, when you compare it to the LG uh, wall, not as spectacular. Not quite as spectacular. It might be time to update the booth. I don't think they change these booths very often. They spend well, millions of dollars yeah, to build Yeah, they do them. spend millions of dollars. No uh, question about it. Probably every few years you update it. This might right. be the last right. year I for this I think this, this was the last, well, I don't know. I, this, I remember this one from last year, but not before that. Okay, so this is its second year. Yeah, but uh, they're in a lot of places around, a lot of the booths have such spectacular demos that you've got these long lines right. of people waiting to get in. We're going to see that at the Sharp booth, in fact, but I've been told we're going to get special we can jump access. The line. Yeah. All right, all right. Yeah, the Panasonic booth is huge. Don't get me wrong, it's gi ginormous, as yeah. they say. Yeah, yeah let's, let's keep going straight down here and then turn right a little bit later. We, uh, we were talking to um, the uh, CES press people, and they they also uh, indicated the uh, this was a uh, attendance was going to be up this year. Yeah. Uh, and I uh, I asked about Microsoft uh, leaving, and they said we've already rented that space. <laughs> so <laughs> they're, they're not they're not too worried about that. In fact, uh, Microsoft didn't close the door on CES. Uh, Steve really? Ballmer kind of said, for now, we're taking a vacation. Uh, a so, vacation um, from CES. I think they may watch carefully to see, and, and then they may find that CES is still a pretty important place f for them to uh, to show the flag. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're headed over to the Sharp booth. This is the central hall where all the most expensive booths, like Microsoft, Panasonic, the biggest, Sony, the Toshiba. The biggest booths, the biggest companies yeah, are, are over here. They're all here. You want to get in this uh, hall if you can. In fact, DTS. The, uh, touted this is their first year they made it they made central it to hall. the central hall <laughs> wow. so they were very proud of that our, on our uh, our right the uh, RCA booth there's an old name an old the radio company. corporation of america i don't right. know if it's now even a the french it's a french company uh, now. Uh, it's thompson that's right yeah. thompson bought them yeah so uh, sharp is coming up we're passing casio musical instruments yeah, Casio is another one of those companies that makes 800 different products. Exactly It's hard right. to pin down. You think of them as watches, synthesizers. They also make televisions. I have to say, uh, Sharp two years ago kind of 
uh, lost me. I was a big Aquos fan, but then yeah. they did that uh, yellow color. Quatron. And, uh, Quatron. They're still doing it. And uh, that kind of lost me on that one. But they've come back in many ways, and they do make some excellent TVs. LG's the one, though, that surprised me. They've really come oh, up they've come very huge, quickly. Just a very are, long time. Are making way. some really good stuff. Oh, I, yeah. I'm, right now, they the, seem to me the one to watch. Of course, Samsung has always been a favorite as well. And the Samsung booth is right next to the Sharp booth. We'll right, see which them. Is where we're going next. Yep. After this. All right, where to, now, uh, kids? This see. is the uh, 4K TV. Are we, uh, did we lose? Oh, we lost Nicole. Okay, okay. I thought you, yeah, I thought we lost the stream. As long as the stream's here, <laughs> this is good. The uh, you're, you're doing a great job this year. We haven't lost signal once. It's been great, even though we're in the worst possible conditions. The uh, live view is just doing a great job. Is it Thank hanging you. in there? Yeah. Good deal. Yeah. So um, it is a beta though, still. So you yeah, know, we're you know. we have a glitch or something, then you know, hope people understand. Uh, it's amazing that we're even able to do this. It blows my mind, you know. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, thank you. Oh, wait a minute. I might have to go over and get that Bluetooth G-Shock watch. That's that, that's Casio is the G-Shock. So that that one's Bluetooth. It's a smart shock. A Bluetooth smart sh smart shock. It has a shock. phone finder, out of range warning. Oh, you know what they've done is they've incorporated that Zom technology that What's that? warns you when it's a little Bluetooth dongle for your keys that warns you when you either leave your phone or your keys behind, an alarm goes off. It pairs to your oh, phone. Oh, that's cool. So imagine your watch paired to your phone, and if you absentmindedly leave your phone behind, your watch goes, hey. <laughs> you left me behind. You left me behind. I'm in the restaurant. I presume you could also do the thing with, uh, with keys. Yeah, it's got a, uh, a phone finder. I might have to get, get one of those. I've always liked those G-Shocks. So we're waiting for my contact here at Sharp, who should be along in a moment. <laughs> because uh, we're going to take a look at 4K, and we're also going to take a look at 8K. Whoa! You were, <laughs> you were holding out on me, I was Scott. holding out on you. I wanted to surprise you. Now, these 4Ks are small. They these... are relatively small. I'm hoping we can, we can find a larger one. I, um, well, the fact that they're showing such small 4Ks means that they think there's a market even at that size. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly right. You know, it's always been a truism. I, mean, I don't know if people are aware of it, but... You don't need the higher resolution if you get a smaller display. We talk about the transition from 720p to 1080p. At a 32-inch display, 720p is fine. You're not going to see the difference. Except, as I always say, for upscaling. Right. Because if you have a 720p display, you won't see the resolution or detail difference. But if, you're, if you put in 1080p or 1080i content, you have, you have to downscale it. And depending on the quality of that processing, right. you might see artifacts that are clearly visible. It's almost always the case that you want native resolution. Whatever right. the resolution of the content is, that's what you want to make. And since most HD content, most HD broadcast content, and certainly Blu-ray, is at 1080, right. that's why I always recommend a 1080 display, right. even in the smaller sizes. You convinced me. <laughs> I don't think you can get a 720p display anymore. Or maybe in the back well, of the hall. Well, you can, yeah. yeah. But here we've got 4K. And once again, I have to say, we don't have 4K content commercially, and we're not going to have it for several years. But I think that's not going to, that will be a quicker change because movies are mostly shot in 4K now. Well, or, or transferred from film to 4K. Right, and the 4K cameras are widely available. At Correct, low cost. widely used. Sony makes them, RED makes them. Yep. So uh, it is a standard. The motion picture industry has settled on its 4K. So I think that bodes well for the it uh, does. arrival it of does. 4K Now content. the question, though, is will the studios, how easily will the studios find a way to release 4K content. Will we need a new format? Can we use Blu-ray? We can't use Blu-ray. Well, uh, we, we'll have to use a, a, a variation of Blu-ray that has yet to be designed. Carrie Hodell is here. Hi, Carrie. Hi there. Good to see you from Sharp. Absolutely. Carrie, good to be here. Scott Wilkinson, how do you do? Very good, thank you. Well, we're excited. So, uh, so was I. <laughs> we so, thought 4K would be a good place to start. I think it is a good place it's to start. It's a fantastic place. So one of the things that I like to call the special sauce in the Sharp 4K is that we're adding something called ICC. So that is Integrated Cognitive Creation. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> so what that stands for is basically the way that the brain interprets light and the way that shadows bounce off of things and detail, dimension, especially dimension. What happens a lot of times when we do up conversion is it's not enough, especially when we're talking about 1080p or 1080i or even an average consumer that's got 1080 
under 720, <laughs> maybe 480. even 480. So this solves the problem of lack of 4K content. You can upscale to 4K w with your high in def a, in content. In a nice way. Absolutely. And that's what it does is it upconverts, but then that special sauce that we mix in there, it adds that ICC, which reintegrates things like definition, texture, and detail so that you feel like you can really step into the picture. It's not just something that's going to recreate a nice picture, but it's going to recreate a realistic feel. Maybe 3D without 3D. Almost. This is what this is what you often say that uh, 4K gives you essentially 3D appearance without the actual 3D. There's enough information. So yeah. what we're seeing here is 2K content upscale. That's correct. What we're looking at behind here is we have a 1080p panel on the right, and we have the 4K panel. Ah, on the left. side by side. Can side we get can we get a little closer we and can, take a look? Absolutely. So we'll let these folks take a picture, and then after that, what we've done is we've split the 1080p feed into two. So we're looking at 1080i, 1080i, 60 oh, hertz. Oh, you've actually... Same exact content, but on the two different but, displays. But you've split the 1080p, so you've got interlaced wow. one interlaced you know field what? on this side and the other interlaced field on this now, side. Now, the people at home are watching at best on HD, so they're not going to notice the difference, but I can tell you there's a remarkable difference. This seems much softer. Yes, and in fact, I'll go ahead and point out a couple of areas to look at. So here on the steps, as well as shadow detail, and then on the steps on this side, notice how you feel like you could literally walk oh, into this Oh, look at that. Picture. There's a significant it's difference. Significantly different. Yeah, yeah. And then here, we've got overlay on the gold blue piece that's on top of the cabinet. How on this side, it looks two-dimensional, and this side, it looks like no kidding. I could reach out and grab. No kidding. So let's open the cabinet, have a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> With native 4K material, it would look even better. Absolutely. So anything that you do beyond what we've got displayed, which is 1080i, it's going to only further improve. Now the 1080p panel would get better, but if you go beyond that, so there's a lot of 4K cameras out there that we're looking at, that's only going to improve the picture quality because you've got that added resolution in addition to that ICC. People at home who use uh, Photoshop, it's really almost an unsharp mask they've applied to get from here to here. It, it is noticeable in the difference. It, it is. It is. It, absolutely. It looks a lot better. One of my favorite descriptions of where this makes the biggest difference is I love talking about things that are moving away or towards you. And one of the things that happens in a lot of movement on a screen, even when we're at the movies, sometimes it's hard to tell at first if it's moving towards you or away from you. And when you're looking at 4K, and I'll show you our 8K. We must see. <laughs> we want to see. What happens there is you can really tell what's happening in front of you as if you're standing there looking at it with the naked eye. Right. How big? These are 60-inch displays? They're 60-inch displays. They are both LED. It's interesting because we don't normally think of 4K at such a small screen <laughs> size. 60 inches, such Scott, a small screen size. it makes a difference. It does. 60 small? There's Come on. You know we do big better. Well, it's <laughs> true, and and uh, Sharp is introducing eighty. Their second generation, eighty inches That's at correct. the show. We'll have another couple of eighty inches this year, and who knows where we'll go from there. <laughs> so, wh when will we see these ICC-based 4K displays? This will be in 2012. So this is a prototype now, but this is coming soon. So within 2012, we're launching this product. Wow. That's interesting. You know, consumers are going to have a really difficult challenge deciding between OLED displays, 4K displays. <laughs> there's, some, there's some good choices. There are there. some good choices. Absolutely. Can I show you guys the 8K? Okay. Please. Let's go see. Twist my arm. So we're moving over and across our booth. We have a lot of our new panels this year. We've got a 6 series, a 7 series, and an 8 series. And now the 9 series now as well. Now the 9 series as well. And of course, the ever wonderful Elite. Oh, <laughs> so we're very excited about the Elite. We are very excited. I'm a, Kuro, a long time Kuro owner, and I was very sad when Pioneer got out of that business, so I'm so glad you guys acquired the technology. Yes, we did, and we have a fantastic partnership with Pioneer, so they've really helped us in developing this product. And the reviews, the customers. We, we, we my Home Theater Magazine reviewed the, yes. the Elite and called it the best TV ever. It is. It truly is. It's a fantastic piece. And that's, an, that, you know, that's a review. That's not just hype. I mean, we took took it through its paces. Right. So well, Let me ask you about 8K. There isn't any 8K content, is there? Well, we happened to find a company that developed a special feed for us. So we are going to be looking at native 8K to oh, an 8K man. panel. So let's see if we can get these folks to let us slide in, in front here. We're gonna, we're gonna slide right in. <laughs> Don't mind us. We'll, we'll get out of your way quick here. So again, this isn't a super huge display. Is this an 80? This is an 85-inch display. And what we're looking at is this 8K technology. 
So eight times 1080p. And we are looking at a native 8K resolution picture. So you're gonna- Wow. That you can feel <laughs> everything that's going on in this. I mean, you can see every little detail in the bricks, the well, flag. You can, even see, you can even see the haze from the air and the distortions caused by the air. It's yes, amazing. Yes. Absolutely. In fact, there's a couple of scenes in here where I believe someone's wearing a digital watch. And you can read it. And you can, and you read can literally it. read the display oh, on the goodness. digital watch. So you can see the boogers in the kid's nose. It's, <laughs> it's just incredible. Poor kid. Give him a break. Look at all that detail so in, in the, the cherry, uh, cherry blossoms. blossoms. And how we feel almost a, a little apprehensive. Like we're it's gonna very fall. real. We're gonna yeah, fall like we're going to fall there. in. Oh, no. Oh, this is spectacular. This reminds me very much of the, Scott, of the first time I saw HD. Yes. The first time I saw 4K. Yes. You get that same, my God, that's realistic. And this is going to eventually become a reality. This is one of our sales meetings here, just so you know. <laughs> I don't want to be in that uh, yeah. <laughs> yellow team. They want to make sure we're going to you know, t stand the test of time. So one of the things that is so applicable about this is that so many film right now, so a lot of films that we can go see right now are in 4K. Correct. And that's obviously on the forefront. So the fact that 8K... It's definitely on the horizon. It makes perfect sense. And there are. <laughs> Look at this guy. <laughs> Whoa! Oh, yeah, you Wow. I don't Look think at that. I can you can do see, that. You definitely can see not. the individual strands of the Well, the interesting rope. thing is you would not normally stand this close exactly. uh, to a Exactly. We're split. like inches and, away. And you really, the detail, it, it holds up. It's amazing. Well, the misconception everyone has with big screen, because we make so many big screens at Sharp, is that you need to sit further away. It is not the case. 1080p gives you fantastic picture, even three, four feet from the screen. 4K is going to give you that same quality. But 8K, we're, what, two or three feet from the And it's immersive. It's immersive Seriously. even at this distance. Look Damn at it. that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Tell me more. <laughs> Look at that. Wow, that is spectacular. That. Now, obviously, this is not uh, yet a, a product. No, this is definitely a prototype. prototype. Concept and we're looking piece. at this, a concept piece. Yes, correct. Especially because of the lack of uh, content. Although I imagine you could apply your ICC uh, upscalers to this as well. I'm sure you <laughs> if could. If you wanted to upscale 4K. Uh, hey, why not, right? <laughs> Video files, here we come. It is, I have a little vertigo. I feel like we're going to fall yeah, over. Yeah, we're, we're on the this. edge of the tower here. So, gentlemen, is there anything else that you would like That's to That's great. Thank you so much, Carrie. Wow, you blew Carrie, my mind. That is so just much. gorgeous. Really appreciate it. 8K, I didn't think it was possible. NHK, of course, uh, shot the uh, video, and PBS helped you out on that. And I don't know where they got an 8K camera, but, you know, the, the march of time. Yeah, for the cables here. This is, this is, of course, where you go. You double and you double again. That's and, right. uh, and just as we saw that kind of doubling in processors, now we're seeing it in things like displays. Uh, and they sure look good. I, you know, unfortunately, I know our audience really can't see what we're seeing, but it is a spectacular uh, view. Yeah. So our next contact, where are we going next? Samsung, right next door. Well, that was easy. That's easy. Boy, uh, 4K, 8K, OLED. I think people are going to have a lot of choices this fall. And, a lot uh, of choices. It's pretty exciting. Yep, yep, that's exactly right. I Here we are in the giant you. Samsung booth. Now, this is a redesigned booth from last year, I think. More or less. Yeah. Um, much lighter than some of the other booths. A lot of the uh, television companies like to have dark black booths. Uh, this is a bright white booth. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. I think we're going to want to go into that corner. Oh, Nicole's on it? Okay, good. So what is, uh, is going to be uh, uh, exciting and new from well, Samsung? Samsung? They do have an OLED, I know. They do have an OLED. And the, their OLED uh, uses a slightly different technology. I'm going to get a little geeky on you here. Okay. I mean, this is, after all, home theater geeks. Hey, you better. <laughs> I'm counting on that. Whereas uh, LG has stacked red, green, and blue organic light-emitting diode material right. along with white right. on top of each other. That's the sub-pixel rendering the sub they were talking rendering, about. sub-pixel rendering, exactly. And a lot of people actually complain about sub-pixel rendering, saying it's not truly uh, HD resolution. I would I would tend to disagree with that, but okay, um, we're going to head over this. W I think we're going to head over this way, and uh, whereas uh, Samsung, on the other hand, has done a more oh, traditional so red, green, blue, separate subpixels, and uh, you know which one is better. We'll see when we when we get to review them, actually look at them. I think but, we're here. Um, 
well, on the other, no, this is the. Um, that's an LED the, LCD. That's, that's an LED. amazing. Yeah, it's a. No, it's there. I think they're top of the line. Seventy-five inches. Yes, it's and called again, the ES eight thousand. I love the skinny bezels because it just gets out of the way, and the detail on this is phenomenal. Uh, and this is picture. just standard HD. This is ten eighty p. That's one of the things that you, you start to realize is the eyes can be easily deceived. Yes. And uh, especially at the distance we're standing, um, this looks as good as any of them, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a beautiful TV. It's a beautiful but TV. But they choose the contents uh, carefully to make oh, sure absolutely. That it shows well. It's almost like um, they use HDR in photography uh, to make the eye jump. You it's, know, and I asked a, a Samsung guy here yesterday whether they set up these TVs as if they were in a showroom, and vivid. he said, "Yes, absolutely. They They're in all vivid. in vivid mode." Yeah. Because look at what look at us. We're in this giant right. showroom with a bunch of TVs it right next to each other. Look yeah. at those eyelashes. Wow. I don't know if you can swing over there before they they, they disappear. She has these feather eyelashes. Uh, they, she missed him. The press desk is over in that corner. That's a brave model that would allow herself to be to be photographed, photographed that, that closely. Yep. Exactly yep. right. Look at those uh, little the droplets, sparklets, yeah. droplets. Yeah. yeah. Colors beautiful. Bigger screens is is another thing we're seeing more of at this show. You know, I think people initially uh, pushed back against big screens. They thought, I don't need such a big screen. I still hear it sometimes from consumers. Oh, come on. Uh, I'll get a 42-inch. It'll be fine. And I almost always tell them, get bigger than you think. That's right. Uh, you're sitting farther than you think. Right. And frankly, uh, the immersion of a 55 or 60 or bigger screen when you're six or a, seven feet away makes a big, big difference. It really does. This is a 75-inch screen. and. Uh, that next to it is a 55 inch and you can see it's a lot more real estate it's not just 20 inches bigger it's a lot more real estate because it's measured diagonally um, I think yeah get the biggest screen you can afford that looks good we're coordinating right now with the Samsung man okay we're gonna go over and look at the OLED we have here all right uh, Stuart Stuart Hi, Stuart. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you, gentlemen. We're going to head over to uh, the OLED display here and take a look at that because, uh, once again, that is one of the stories of CES, I believe, this year, is the emergence of large panel OLED. You know, it's interesting. One of the stories of the phone space this year has been the emergence of Samsung as the dominant Android uh, phone uh, manufacturer by far, and of course Samsung made its name with the Super AMOLED displays on those phones right. that really blew people's minds. And the Galaxy, the Galaxy 2, and now the Galaxy Nexus, people are just really raving about those screens. So it makes sense in a way that Samsung would take its success with uh, Super AMOLED displays and a small form factor and uh, try to parlay it into success in television. Exactly, now can we get in a little closer? Uh, yeah, so it's, as you can see, it's one of the attractions of the show so it's uh, it's been difficult to get anywhere close to these sets. So, thank we'll you elbow guys. our way in. Yeah, absolutely. We, we've got Please a tank here. Let's let's move in here a little closer. So, how how thick are these uh, TVs? Well, we don't have an official number on how thick they are, but they are by far and away the thinnest TVs we've built so th to date. And the electronics would be in the base. The electronics are in the base. Now, this is not a finished production piece here. Right. No, this is very close. You expect to sell these this year? We expect them out in 2012, yes. And I don't think you're announced a price yet. Not announced a price, yeah. no. Yeah. Uh, Not even a model number yet. Nope, none of that. You give me your credit card, and when it shows up on the bill, you'll know how <laughs> you much know it what? costs. I would. If you would do that, I would do that. Uh, these are 55 inches? 55, yes. How do you get them so big? I mean, you've figured out, obviously, how to do production of AMOLED displays right. at a smaller scale, but this has always been a challenge to get them any bigger. How are you doing that? Well, we're one of the first companies to figure out how to etch AML, uh, well, OLED, onto a single pane of glass. And that really has allowed us to increase the screen size dramatically. Interesting. And what about the rejection rate? Do you, do you, have you cut that significantly? Or? We, uh, I believe we have, but I don't have anything okay. on that. Yeah. What about yeah. the longevity of the blue, which has always been a problem? Right. Um, that also seems to be quite a bit better. But I, once again, I don't have anything I can officially announce on that, sorry. Well now, well, one of the things I notice about OLED TVs, and we see it here, is the incredible saturation and vividness of the colors. I'm assuming that the color gamut 
is actually extending beyond the normal uh, color gamut that we see on HDTV. Uh, yes, that's one of the benefits of OLED, the organic light emitting diode, is that you know, especially if you're using red, green, and blue subpixels like we are, no color films, no color filters involved, we are able to get better color as well as deep, rich blacks. We're not sacrificing one to get the other with this product. And again, deep, rich blacks are what are the OLED story and one of the great strengths of OLED. Look, if you can see that in the, in the video. Would the loss of the white subpixel affect the, the brightness of the white or? Well, that's a good question. No, LG, of course, as you know, is using a white subpixel as well. You're not. Um, are the you losing bright? The whites look fine here. I don't yeah, the see. whites look good to me. Yeah, you tell me. I mean, it, it, I certainly think we we're getting a very bright, very vibrant picture out of this product. What about um, subpixel distortion? Leo, you were talking about sub Yeah, I, I often see one of the things I don't actually like about the Nexus is you're using a subpixel display there, and I see color noise uh, from it. You, the whites are not pure white. Um, I don't see that here. No, I don't uh, but either. But you're not using a pentile display as you are on the Nexus. So. I think you. I think that that eliminates that, may that be issue. That the issue, yeah. the solution to the I problem. I mean, it's pure RGB. There's nothing else to. Uh... Right. Exactly. And it just looks stunning. Again, uh, you know, I'm. I can't wait to get one in the studio to review. Yeah. And probably buy. <laughs> well, that's. It's going to be interesting. We were just over looking at four and eight K displays. Consumers are going to have some real choices for the first time in a long time uh, later this year between different display technologies once again. It was LCD, LCD, LCD for a long time. Right, and LCD uh, or plasma. Yeah, you know? yeah, and uh, and now uh, the OLEDs now OLED. are uh, new. That's exciting. Quite incredible. Yeah. All right, now, the what other else? Thing, the other thing we have at the Samsung booth that I that I hope you'll show us is something pretty cool. They've also got uh, new smart TV functions and so on. Yeah, very important. But in particular, what I thought you'd be interested in is um, AT. Is it a, uh, Verizon? Verizon. Verizon is offering live TV over IP. So you can cut your cable, but get cable TV. Get your live shows. Get essentially that way. So let's go take a look at that. Sure, absolutely. We are going to go that way. <laughs> uh -oh. Stu, lead us. Lead the way. Lead the way. We've got an amazing crew. They're really now, good at. I, I want to point. I want to point out for Hilton the uh, the display uh, on the ceiling. Samsung has done an amazing job look here at in that. their booth. Yeah. LG's was impressive. This is also impressive in a different way because it's love suspended. These cubes. Isn't that great? So it looks like uh, there are uh, panels attached together, uh, six panels attached into a, a single cube. It's pretty spectacular. What's also spectacular is the synchronization so that you get a, a consistent display. And they did that last year, too. Right, exactly. And, and it's really kind of amazing that it's they're really able to do that. It's really quite amazing. Yeah, yeah. We're actually heading into the cube now. So I only heard about this last night at dinner with Samsung. I had dinner with Samsung last night, and um, all right. And having essentially having cable TV without the cable sounded like an amazing. Well, it's what cord cutters want. Now, exactly. Uh, what we also want is a la carte. We don't if if. If, uh, if Verizon it, it, just makes it another cable company, that's not that's going to be. that's a problem. Be that's not going to fly. A, a, an improvement. S certainly, I agree. A la carte is exactly the way to go. But we, we perhaps we can ask well, and if that's, that's, that's one of the things that's interesting about apps and why I'm glad to see apps on these TVs. Yes, is because if they do make a truly open app space, you'll see content creators create their own apps. Yep. You'll see channels create their own apps, and that does disintermediate the cable companies, and and it does right. give you a la carte access. So that's right. huge. So here we are. Here at, we are. Um, Verizon Live TV. This is for people with access to Fios. Right. So the idea here is that this will be an app on our Samsung TVs. This will be an app on our TVs and our Blu-ray players that will allow you to, if you are a Fios subscriber, you'll enter in your authentication codes and get it right through that application. You don't need an additional box or... Yeah, exactly. So you'll, you'll still need to be a subscriber, keep in mind. But you won't need that box maybe for the second TV. All right. This, this will stream to whatever TV in your house? Yeah, as long as it has the, Samsung, has the app. Uh, the Samsung yeah, infrastructure, absolutely. Now, is it going to be identical to Ver like just subscribing to Verizon? Or are you going to be able to do an a la carte thing of choose this channel or that channel or this channel? It's going to depend. My understanding at this point is it's going to depend on your package with right. Verizon. And you're stuff. doing the same thing with DirecTV, you're doing Direct the same TV. thing with Comcast, Time Warner. 
So oh. all no more cable boxes, no more set top boxes. Well, They're built into the television now. That's probably a few years out before it's completely gone. But right. that ultimately, TV over IP. Right. Samsung, we want to be ahead of that as much as possible. Right. So we want to give people reasons to bring content into our televisions, no matter how they want to do it. Now, have you looked at all at the difference in quality between the programming coming over the cable or the satellite and the quality coming over IP? Um, yes, and it is variable on both, eye, both sides. Um, you know, sometimes the cable can be better than the IP, sometimes IP can be better than cable. One of the things that we are building into a lot of our sets this year, however, are some chipsets that will in fact break up the macro blocking for uh, video distortion over uh, streaming content and get you a cleaner, more accurate picture. Samsung is one of the few companies that actually makes their own chips, designs and makes their own system on a chip, or SOCs, uh, which, let, which lets you do that. Yes, it is. In fact, it's letting us go even further than that in uh, 2012 and then further into the future. One of the things we announced at the show this year is something called Smart Evolution, where on select models of our televisions, we'll actually have a proprietary port on the back where you'll be able to buy an upgrade kit and so when the 2013 TVs come out with a whole set of new features, instead of buying a new TV, you buy this kit, plug it in the back, and you're good to go. That's critical. As you start to put applications and interfaces on here, people want to upgrade them every couple of years. We expect to upgrade our phone. We expect to upgrade our TV now. Or, yeah. Exactly. And, you know, everybody is used to now firmware updates, and they, they know these terms. They're doing them to the TVs, but it only can take you so far. The hardware is now the stopgap. So if we can find a way around the hardware or to replace the hardware easily, consumer friendly, everybody wins. It's really interesting because Ford is doing exactly the same thing for the same reason. You know, TVs and are, are durable goods, cars even more so. Yeah. And, but people are starting to expect to upgrade every year uh, their other stuff, so why not your TV too? But as you say, the, the hardware is the, is the uh, limiting factor. And if you can plug in a little piece of hardware in the back of the TV that makes it a 2013 TV, 2014 TV, and so on. That's that's huge. I mean, obviously, there will ultimately be even be a limit to that, but yeah. it'll extend the life and extend the, uh, the end user's satisfaction with their purchase beyond one year. What's your app platform? Do you have a dedicated app platform? We do have a dedicated app platform. It's Samsung uh, Smart Hub We have uh, and Samsung app apps. We have an SDK. We just moved to version 3 on it. Um, so we have In fact, they hold of apps. they hold contests to independent app developers. Well, we've got to obviously create a Twit app for a Samsung television. Exactly so right. That's next on our, do you know anything about the app development? Um, I know a little bit. I can. I'll do my best. <laughs> is it uh, is it done in the C or is it done with a JavaScript and CSS? We're doing JavaScript. I believe right now we've added HTML5 and a few others. So it's really HTML5 apps. Those are pretty easy to do. That's that's what that seems to be the trend. Yeah. So that's great. If you do that, that's something we can easily adapt to whatever we've done so far to. That's great. So right now we've got. I think we're working with something like 25,000 different development teams and, and 500 apps worldwide, a little over 200 here in the US, US right now. So, uh, Is it open platform? In other words, do you vet the apps or do you limit the apps? Could somebody put a porn app on a Samsung TV? We do absolutely vet things. And more than just content like you're talking, but is the application right for the TV? Is it right for a Blu-ray player? Because one that's right for a TV might not be right for a Blu-ray player, and vice versa. So I want to protect the user experience. We do, absolutely do. And also, um, we do, certainly have different levels of processing within our, our product. Some of our better TVs are actually going to dual-core processors now, and an app may not work right on a single core, so we want to make sure that people are getting what they expect. Is there anywhere we could uh, take a look at the remote and the uh, interface? Do you, you have a place we could go uh, look at the apps? I, it's awfully crowded over here, I have oh, to say. Yeah. You're popular, what can I say? Very popular booth. So actually, I believe we can get it on one of these TVs. Where's the best place to look at the apps? UI or Smart Hub, is that what we're looking for? And, and the, uh, the, the remote, I'd be interested in looking. Okay, well. Oh, the, the, you're talking about the uh, Smart Interaction? No, the, uh, the Smart Hub interface. Oh, itself. Smart Hub interface. I was going to ask you about, while we're, while we're waiting for that, the Smart Interaction, you can't okay. show us. Well, Actual. what's that? Ah, uh, this uh, is. So let's step over to these. Uh, okay. okay. I see 
for instance, Time Magazine here. This is interesting because this isn't traditional television content. This is magazine content. Right. But once you've done it in HTML5, it, you know you can really start putting some customized web content up here very easily. Yeah, exactly. So here's the interface to the uh, Smart Hub. It looks a lot like a computer. Why don't you get over there with Stuart? Sure. So now I'll the stand smart, here. smart interaction is the third pillar, I think, of well, your of your t story at CES. Let me get through the Smart Content. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Smart Evolution was the upgrade platform. Smart content, we've talked a little bit about our content partners over there, and then the Smart Hub interface with our apps, um, and then a variety of, of content in here. One, uh, two I want to point out, or one in particular, is search. One of the pain points we discovered a couple years ago, actually, is where is the content I want to watch? Right. So, maybe On I demand, to... it could be in an app, it could be on broadcast. Right. This will search across all those platforms? Not quite. It will search across apps, okay, but it won't search across your content provider. Right, the All cable right, so guide, for instance. Again, yeah, it won't do that. So that, but it is getting part of that pain point down. You're spending more time watching and less time searching. Right. But I, then the next step is this little dude up here. So on many of our models, you're going to see a camera built into the bezel, camera and microphone right up here. Interesting. It's a little little camera. This moves into our smart interaction. This little camera allows us to do lots of things. Certainly, we have Skype, and we can do video chat in a variety of different ways. But <coughs> sounds like me. this is ultimately a Connect style interface. Will I be able to gesture to it, talk to it, things like that? If I had that, would you buy one today? <laughs> um, I might. I might. So I might. Absolutely. That's very interesting. So it, that camera enables more than just video conferencing. Right. So you'll be able to, on select models of Samsung, our ES8000, our ES7500, sit down on the couch and say, hi, TV, and right. watch it power up. Right. Hi, TV, volume up. Right. Hi, TV, channel 222. And because we're including an IR blaster, a wireless IR blaster, it will control your cable box if you still need that. All right? And, and you in the smart hub here, you'll be able to wave a hand. The cursor will pick it up. Get it over an icon, grab it, and it launches. Yeah, that's interesting. I love it, and LG did this too, where this also integrates control of the TV. So you have a sim simple, simple integrated interface to every function on the TV, content as well as settings and all of that stuff. I think that's a good idea. But unlike LG, here you're not you're not holding a physical thing. You're waving right. your hand. Right. And now, well, now you will. That's to be. That's the future, right? It's not. It's launching now. Aha, uh -huh. very so interesting. So in this model year, we will have this out. Very interesting. All right, so in a couple right. months, you're going to see this. And then the, the final thing about it that I find so fascinating is facial recognition. Yeah, so you'll notice that we have a login down here. That allows you to use one login to get into a variety of different services, your Facebook, YouTube, all of those, so that you only have to remember one login. That We did that last year. The challenge was you still had to type in a username and a right. password with right. a remote. Now we're using the camera to use Let's your face you. as your login and username. Wow. Or login and password. That's really cool. So you stare at the TV and suddenly it knows everything there. Is, is there. Wow. And when your, your stuff other, comes up. Right. Your layout. When your significant other, your kids sit down, their stuff comes up. And as a parent, you can even curate what your kids can see and do through that. Very cool. And that will be available later this year. Yes, sir. That's great. Stuart, thank you. You're very welcome. Thank, yeah. you. thank you so much. You know, there's really two more days it. to CES. You better watch out. And two more days and my voice is already <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks so much. Very good stuff. You know, you're starting to see a real uh, kind of commonality in what the manufacturers are looking at as far as user interface. Exactly Microsoft's right. doing something very similar with its Xbox with TV. The and Connect, Connect stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the real question is, will people use it? I wonder, I'd love to see statistics about how many people have these features in their TV but never use them. Yes, exactly. And I think that the complexity often scares consumers away. I don't know, uh, you know, the idea is to make TV more friendly, easier to use, but I wonder in the long run if it does that or just makes it more difficult to use. <laughs> Do we well, want a TV that's as hard to use as your computer, for instance? Right, right, certainly not. There's a lot of us who just like to turn it on, change it to Channel 3, and watch Oprah. Right, exactly right. But those days are long gone, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> not just because Oprah's retired, but because you can't do that anymore. Right, exactly. Well, we have a little time left, I think.
we could zoom over to Sony, which well, is right next door. Well, I was right just going to say, used to be the first booth you'd go to would be the Sony booth. Now it's Samsung, it's LG, it's Sharp. Well, I got to tell you, Sony's press conference was a big extravaganza, as always. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Will Smith showed up uh, as wow. the star of Men in Black 3, and they wow. showed a clip from that. Um, uh, the, one of the big idols, American Idol stars, Kelly Clarkson, came and sang a song. Well, they spent some money. They spent some money, but they and Barry Sonnenfeld was there with Will Smith for Men in Black 3, but they didn't, they didn't give us a lot of detail about what they were showing in terms of product, at least not home theater products. Right. They had some other stuff. They had tablets, and they had cell phones, and they had cameras and stuff like that. I do know that they're showing what they're calling crystal LED TV. They're not calling it OLED. I believe it is OLED. Do you we, want to go over and we look? We could take a quick look. All right, let's see. If we have time. Sony, no baloney. <laughs> it's funny, really, to see how quickly a, a brand can go from being the premier brand in consumer electronics uh, to an also ran. And vice versa, how Lucky Gold Stars turned it itself into a premium That's product. exactly right. Now, I wouldn't exactly call Sony an also-ran. All right. Not yet, anyway. All right. Um, I was a little disappointed that their uh, press conference didn't have more about the content. crystal LED and, yeah. co and real content. Um, you know, they, they were more about the flash and right. the sizzle and not right. so much about the meat. But One thing... I uh, Samsung's also introduced, besides some great phones, they now have the Galaxy Note, oh, yeah, which is a really interesting phone. Huge announcement. Five-inch display, and uh, I, kind of, I just played with one uh, on our stage a few minutes ago, and I really uh, liked it. Uh, I like a bigger phone. I know a lot of people think that's just too big. It, it, um, it did look kind of big to me when I saw it on uh, the guy holding it on the stage. But it's easier on the eyes. It's easier to type. It's not, ta not quite tablet size yet. Uh, Samsung it's is kind of really halfway on a, between. On a roll. It's halfway between for people who can't decide. It's a, it's a phablet. I call it. <laughs> a phone tablet. Now Sony introduced something they, they think, is the next generation in tablets, which is a foldable tablet. Yeah, they call it the Yoga. <laughs> no, really. Did, did they really? Well, I, I think it was the Sony. I'm not sure. There's a there's a Yoga laptop no, that uh, does the downward else. dog. Well, maybe that's another one. <laughs> I swear, I'm not kidding. Oh maybe it's God. Toshiba. Uh, <laughs> it must have been Toshiba. I don't Lenovo think did it. Okay. Uh, Lenovo. Okay. <clears throat> because uh, <laughs> no yeah. No yoga from them. Canon's also here now. Uh, Canon will also have, a, I'm sure, a large booth at the uh, PMA show over at the Venetian. I'm going to head over there a little later this afternoon. Uh -huh. uh, but this is, of course, where they show off their camcorders, their cameras, their printers. Uh, I suppose they even have TVs. I don't know. It's, it's no, kind they, of I, they don't no have any TVs, TVs from Canon. Canon was was involved in the SED TV. You remember That's that? Right. They wanted to be in With the television Toshiba. business. They wanted to be in the television business, and that was a like the OLED, a super deep black, right. Really thin, really amazing. But didn't make them. They didn't make them because of legal issues, yeah. not because of technological. Well, maybe technological issues as well. I suspect the legal issues were a smokescreen. The legal for issues, the technological well, issues. Well, that, okay. That'd be my guess. That could certainly. Could you can certainly always get be. around the legal issues if you can make it. So the Sony's um, slogan is still "Make dot believe." Yep. Uh, they've added though, "Play, watch, listen, share." And, and once again, uh, they're they're touting this whole ecosystem of sharing information from TV to tablet to computer to smartphone right. and back and forth in every which way you want. Hey, there's the Twit logo. They have uh, apparently they have uh, Twit on their Sony Bravias. Oh, excellent! I just saw our logo float by. Wow, that makes me happy. Now, uh, so I, I like Sony a lot better now. <laughs> <laughs> That's their Sony Internet TV that they're talking I'm about. I'm trying to. I don't know where their crystal LED is. I hope to find it very yeah, soon. Sony here. is one of those companies that does everything from uh, e-readers to tablets to televisions. Everything. They're a big uh, company and a booth to match. Yes, absolutely. The Bravia line is still around. That's their Yeah, that's their TV. Well, it's their entire TV line. The they're, whole line is the now Bravia. The whole line is called Bravia, yep. Um, let me see if I can find a Sony One person. of the things that they made a big deal about, hang, I don't know on, if they did it at the second. press conference, was the Vita. Don't keep backing up. <laughs> sorry. Backing up. Now Back we're backing up. up. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I didn't want us to be wandering. Here, we're going to go around this way. The last stop on our tour of, and we've, we've basically traversed the entire Central Hall. We have. We've gone from That's front a pretty to good back. tour. It's a pretty good tour. So we're going to head off to the left here.
The Sony booth is actually not quite as crowded, is it? No. No, it isn't. I, I think that, uh, of course, people hear about things like the 55-inch OLED, and they and flock they, to that booth. That's absolutely right. And that's right. one of the... It, one of the games that's always played at CES, or was for many years played at CES. Remember the the LCD wars where uh, Sharp would announce a 103-inch LCD display, and then somebody else would announce a 104-inch LCD display. Right, right. And and uh, I remember one year, uh, one company kept their 105-inch under wraps until after the show opened, uh, and uh, and scooped everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but that you don't see anymore. I do think that the big story that people are talking about is the 55-inch. OLEDs, and if Sony's crystal is anything like it, they Pardon missed me. a bet by not touting it like the they, OLED. They really did. I'm because sorry, that did uh, earn a lot of attention for LG and uh, for Samsung. For Samsung, and rightly so. And a lot of booth attention. This sure does look like a uh, OLED. It's hard to tell, though, doesn't it? Yeah, they have not? it side by side, and it's a 55-inch display side by side Here with a traditional LCD display. They're calling it Crystal LED. They are. And, uh, you know, when they say it's a self-emission, that tells me that tells it is me an OLED it is. display. It's, it's exactly RGB, right. a self-emission. Um, you know, this guy substrate. knows what he's talking about. We yes, should talk to him. Exactly Andy Henninger from, uh, from Sony. Andy, Scott Wilkinson with uh, Home Theater Geeks, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. When you get a chance, we'd love to ask you about this display. Okay. Sounds like okay. you knew what you were talking about. That's probably why they don't want you on camera, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. I don't want to get it's you in trouble. It's above your pay grade. Okay, That's okay. Don't worry Continue about it. your conversation. We'll just listen Pardon in. Pardon us for interrupting. <laughs> but it, it is a beautiful display, and when you put it side by side with the uh, LED, LCD, what, yeah. LCD, what you see is a much better black rendition. Exactly right. Much better motion detail, too. You can Look see at that. The, the words on the menu very clearly, whereas here they're quite a bit more uh, blurry. So he said it was a substrate? A single substrate, which is another clue that it's OLED. Self-emitting, single substrate, RGB. Yep. It sounds like OLED. OLED. But like Sony often does, they want to call it something else, right. and they want to distance themselves from the pack in that sense. Right. Like with uh, LCOS projectors, right. a liquid crystal on silicon. Uh, Sony makes them. Uh, JVC makes them. JVC calls it DILA. Right. They invented it, actually. Right. Uh, LCOS is the generic name. Sony called it SXRD. I remember, yeah. Silicon Crystal X right. Reflective Display. Right. And they, they tried to distance themselves, say, oh, no, 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 this is not LCOS. Well, it is. Right. So similarly, here we have Crystal LED, self-emissive, single layer, RGB. It's OLED. Yeah. It can't be anything yeah. else. Uh, it's, and, it looks, uh, and it looks like OLED, and like it's OLED. beautiful. Yeah, very uh, rich, uh, dark blacks. Uh, strong colors, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly right. So, um, hi Matt, Leo Laporte from Home Theater Geeks, Scott Wilkinson. Matt, how you doing? Matt Parnell. We were just looking at this display and saying, what? That's all right. Oh, okay. That's well, okay. Thank you. Well, thanks anyway. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk on camera. I know. Um, this this is uh, unusual, but that's okay. not for Sony. Yeah. Well. I think we should wrap it up anyway. I, I think do. I think we're about time. We've come to the end of our uh, time. and We uh, have. And, uh, boy, it's been a great tour. What a wonderful time spending with I you. I love yes. doing this. And I love kicking it off with uh, Alan Parsons. What a great uh, interview Elliot that Shiner. was. Huh? Those guys really are legends in the business. And uh, it's neat to see them, like us, still going strong after yep. all these years. Yep. And embracing <laughs> new technology. Absolutely. And exactly. hair dye. So uh, <laughs> got to remember the hair dye. Yeah, right. So, uh, thank you for joining us. We thank our friends at Ford for sponsoring Home Theater Geeks this week. Uh, Live View. And Live View, too, making this possible. I know Hilton is thanking Live View. That little pack <laughs> has just made his day so much easier. Thanks, Ken, for bringing that along and letting us use the beta version of Live View. Yeah. It worked flawlessly the whole time, and I think that's pretty good. Now, we will make an edited version of this available, not too edited, available on uh, twit.tv for download. Audio as well as video, although I think you're going to want to watch the highest quality video to get some idea of what these displays look like. What we're talking about, that's like. right. Right. And you'll be back next Monday at your regular time. Next Monday time. at my regular time, uh, 1.30 to 2.30 Pacific, 4.30 to 5.30 Eastern, where we'll, we will do a wrap-up, well, an hour-long wrap-up of CES 
with uh, Barb Gonzalez and Tom Norton, two of my colleagues from home theater, who have been out seeing different stuff than me. Great. So great. Uh, it'll be a wide-ranging uh, discussion and wrap-up and follow-up of, uh, of CES. What a great week. Thanks, Scott. We're going to send it back to the stage. TNT is coming up next. On behalf of Scott Wilkinson and Leo Laporte, thanks for joining us on Home Theater Geeks. We'll see you later. Geek out.